Good morning, everybody. Um, we are here today. We'll be talking about the future of togetherness as we the title of this virtual panel. Uh, we were talking about uh, the spaces for the performing arts, uh, as well as uh, museums, galleries, cinemas, and in the whole series of buildings. We in the panel with us today, we've got three fantastic panelists. First of all, Nicola Wolves, which helped us put together the event. Uh, Nicola is the head of arts uh, at Page Park Architects in Glasgow and like the practice they've been involved in some amazing projects all over the Scotland and the UK as well. They are the, the talents behind the stunning Theatre Royal in Glasgow and they've recently completed a 13 million pound refurbishment of the Leeds Play, Playhouse for which they are running for an AJ award so fingers crossed. Uh, as well in the panel with us is Alex Rijek uh, from New Zealand, but now a bit Scottish for the last 13 years. Alex is the general director of the uh, Scottish uh, Opera uh, and is, is been appointed in 2006 after working at the New Zealand Opera for four years and uh, International Festival of Arts and is being involved in arts all his life. Uh, so we're looking very much for, forward to hear what he has to say from his perspective, which is a very challenging one, I believe. Uh, last in the panel is Andrew from Bureau Happold. Uh, Andrew is a, a structural engineer, uh, the Goddard degree at Cambridge. So uh, he's specialized in uh, uh, theaters and he's got incredible experience in the museums and the performance venues. And he's, uh, he's got extensive experience as well in timber design and engineer. And he's the, is the one of the first ones that have been using the cross laminated timber in his buildings. Andrew's been involved in some amazing projects like the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in London, as well as the National History Museum in London. Uh, and the Centre for Music in London as well. So that's uh, uh, the structure for the event today. We, the, our panels will give us a little bit of intro about uh, themselves and then we have a set of questions and then in the meantime, please feel free to ask your own questions. There is a Q&A section here that you can use uh, and we'll try to make it as interactive as possible. So that's enough from me. Uh, leave the stage to Nicola that she'll be speaking about herself. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, yeah. Thank, thanks very much, Sarah, for that introduction. Yeah, um, I've been kind of heading up the arts and culture team at Page Park now for over 10 years. Um, and we've worked on some fantastic projects with all scales of organisations right across the UK. Um, I think reflecting on what's going on at the minute and what we're all living through, you kind of, as an architect, you never stop learning. But in, in the case of COVID-19 and this current pandemic, all the kind of rules have been thrown out of the window. It's impacting greatly on all aspects of our lives. But as an architect, I like to think I'm in the business of optimism and that we, we need to look forward beyond this and, and see kind of how we can help. Um, the impact of COVID-19 on cultural organisations has been great. Um, I think partly because cultural buildings and are the places that we choose to gather and we choose to spend time to gather for enjoyment, for education, for inspiration. Um, so unlike um, you know, some of the questions around getting our, our children back into schools or getting ourselves back into our workplace, which are, are viewed as essential, um, for many people um, you know, interacting and going to cultural venues is something that they choose to do and not a necessity. And because they're gathering places, they're the very antithesis of social and physical distancing. Um, and I think there are lots of parallels with the hospitality sector over the issues of trust and rebuilding confidence so people feel comfortable going back into these buildings. Um, the cultural sector does contribute greatly to the economy and I, I was looking for figures and there are lots of figures out there. Um, so uh, 
it's difficult to assess, but you know, some of the figures that I've been reading is that it's worth at least 10.8 billion pounds a year to the UK economy, but that was excluding the museums and galleries sector. Um, so it's, it's not insignificant, but I think its real value isn't just economic, it's about the social impact and about health and well-being. Um, and our arts and cultural institutions and attractions are regarded as world leading. And so I think it's going to be very important going forward in a kind of post pandemic post Brexit world um, that culture is going to be increasingly important in terms of UK's soft power. Um, the cultural sector is very broad at Page Park. Most of our work is either with museums and galleries or the performing arts venues. Um, the museums and galleries sector, there are about two and a half thousand museums in the UK, about 1800 of which are accredited, but those range in size and scale from the national collections, usually based in London, right through to kind of small local volunteer led museums, some are funded and are parts of the local authority, some are embedded in universities, um, and it's a thriving independent museum sector. Similarly, the performing arts, you know, it can range from a pub back room where the local band cuts its teeth through to international concert halls. Um, the theatre sector alone, we have producing houses, receiving houses, publicly subsidised theatre, commercial theatre, and many arts organisations have charitable status. So it's incredibly wide ranging. And while some organisations will have the resource and the capacity to think their way around the challenges that we're, we're all facing, many smaller organisations simply don't. And I think, you know, in terms of kind of responses to this, there's going to be no one size fits all. Um, and it's a very fluid situation because, you know, I woke up this morning to hear on the radio that Boris Johnson is very likely to be announcing the reduction in social distancing from two metres to one metres this morning. So, hence, we haven't pre prepared any presentations because they would probably be out of date a few hours later. So, I, I suppose in discussing this event with Sarah, I was thinking, well, how can we, the design community, help our cultural clients reoccupy their buildings in the short term? Term. And then what are the likely longer term trends that are going to emerge to make the sector more resilient going forward? Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's kind of my introduction, I guess, to spread, send a bit, bit of context and background to this event. Thank you very much, Nicola. Alex, I, have you got something to add from your perspective as well? Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you, Nicola. Uh, so uh, it's my great privilege to be the General Director of Scottish Opera. Uh, and I thought I might just take a moment just to tell you a little bit about us um, for no reason except I think it helps paint a really clear picture of the challenges that uh, we've got ahead. So um, we are uh, almost 60 years old as an organisation founded in Glasgow in 1962. Um, in this day and age, we perform in over 55 communities across Scotland every year, ranging from our own theatre, the Theatre Royal in Glasgow, 1,500-seater, the Festival Theatre in Edinburgh at 1,700 seats, uh, His Majesty's, an old Matcham Theatre in um, uh, Aberdeen and Eden Court in Inverness. They're our core four venues. And then we step down from that to a whole array of much smaller, um, particularly community venues, largely run uh, largely run by volunteers so it's not unknown for us to be sold out in the festival theater in edinburgh at 1700 and also to be sold out in somewhere like um, uh, for example uh, near open for 300 seats um, i would say that uh, just again for context that in our 50th anniversary which is in 2012 we uh, visited over 50 communities and were able to identify on the map of scotland that we the uh, something like 90 percent of the population of scotland was within 30 minutes drive of one of our performances worth noting because the land mass of scotland uh, is just under 40 percent of the land mass of the uk it's certainly true that we're the largest performing arts organization in scotland and given that one of the kind of causes uh, one of the well causes one of the particular pain thresholds of this covid 19 journey has been freelancers it's worth noting that 
our business model has us employing over 500 freelancers per annum. They're an incredibly important part of our the ebb and flow of our um, of our business model. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other wee things just to add: the um, we've also participated in, in an array of audience surveys, and we've one survey's run the rounds twice. And what it points to, paradoxically, is that all of our audiences, in particular, are desperate for a return to live performance. But the paradox is, as Nicola said earlier, they will only come back when they feel they can trust the uh, experience of coming into and being in our theatres. I think it's really interesting that uh, theatres in general and the performing arts uh, seem to be right at the very end of the scale in terms of a return to business. Um, I think the subtlety in my kind of final introductory remark really is the subtlety of all of this is that people talk about organisations, but actually it's the buildings that are the bedrock of the performing arts, because without the buildings, by and large, we can't perform. And really, I'm here, given that we've got you know, a relationship with over 55 venues every year, I'm here to um, learn and listen as much as to make any contributions that might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And last but not least, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me along. Great, great to meet and, uh, and, and share my thoughts on this. Um, uh, as, as said in my introduction, I'm a partner at Bureau Hapol. My background is a structural engineer, but I've been privileged to work with a really diverse, broad range of cultural institutions um, across the across the UK and internationally. Bureau Hapol is an international um, uh, engineering consultancy, and there's the, the, in preparing for this, I did I talked to uh, colleagues in Europe to understand what they were experiencing, um, and, uh, and and where we may in the UK um, follow. But um, co context-wise, just to, to, to set the scene and things that I was that, that was filling my mind before um, COVID, um, I was doing a, a lot of work um, around the climate emergency response and uh, uh, and working with uh, cultural organisations to um, embed that in the, uh, in their uh, in their operations, um, and that still remains a uh, a key. Um, challenge and a key focus um, within the medium to longer term um, for, 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 for the sector. Um, the challenge of um, that, that is a uh, physical um, as well as uh, economic challenge. Um, the Mendoza report recognised that there have been a 13% reduction in uh, funding for galleries and museums over the last 10 years. So that puts has, the context of the, of the COVID crisis has, is, is in one of uh, significant um, tightening of belts and, and strain um, on, on organisations. Um, and that challenges organisations' resilience. Um, talking with uh, and working with organisations like the major museums in uh, in London, challenge of uh, a, an, and concern of uh, a replica, a repeat uh, event like uh, the fire in Brasilia um, and uh, Notre Dame. So key challenges around resilience of the amazing built assets of the cultural sector across the UK is, uh, is key. So that's the sort of pre-COVID context, um, but COVID has only, uh, has only fought against that and, provide, and, and, and increased, those, increased those challenges. Um, and that, uh, as, as has been said before, there's no one size fits all. Um, but there are a key set of themes that run but, uh, uh, around the economic operating model um, and how, how how that can be made to made to work in a in in, in a very high level of uncertainty um, going going forward and into the future. Um, the rebuilding of, of of trust in the operation of venues in the context of uh, a, of a world and um, where trust in state organizations and politics is is in an all-time low trust in uh, cultural organizations um, is high um, and that's leverage for those for those organizations that that must be pull, pulled upon um, and also the current the context of equity um, black lives matter um, other um, key um, social challenges um, are all issues which uh, in the medium to longer term, the cultural sector in the UK has a, has a key 
um, role to, um, to, to play. So we, we look at this as, yes, how can we get organisations back engaging with audience, but then dry, moving through to a longer term um, benefits to, uh, to society and community. Good, thank you very much. So I'll start, fire off the first questions for all of you. And then we have a question from Brian Houston as well, already on, that's fantastic, Brian. Thank you very much. Remember, if you want, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A sections, which is easier to keep track of everything so we don't miss out on any of you. So Nicola, um, as Alex was saying, there is a mixture of, People can't wait to go back to the theatre and at the same time there is undoubtedly some anxiety about being closed in, in, in spaces with crowds. What do you think, uh, what do you see as the critical issues to be overcome to get people back into the stunning buildings? Yeah, well I, I think um, you know, we're expecting some government guidelines to come out um, to to help the sector think about this. Um, but I, I think every organisation will have its own challenges and equally its own opportunities. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned that cultural buildings have effectively been mothballed now for, for three years, uh, for three months, and these buildings still need to be secured, they need to be heated, they need to be maintained. Um, and all of this is adding to the financial pressure of organisations. Um, but I think the biggest issue is the challenge of social distancing and therefore, you know, any, any announcements made later today, I think will be, be gratefully received by some sectors within the cultural world. Um, namely, I, I think museums and galleries, because I think there are ways that they can see about planning to reopen and reopen. Um, things like having time slots, allocating tickets, um, one-way circulation. I mean, some, depending on your building, there might, might be some issues around that, but most will probably be able to think their way through that. Um, I think social distancing for performing arts venues in particular is really, really difficult. Um, and I think that's why that section needs particular support. Um, we've been doing some analysis for some of our performing arts clients, so I've been testing out seating capacities and essentially um, most theatres typically, uh, a typical row depth is 900 millimetres, so if we're talking about a metre social distancing, even at that point you can only occupy every other work row. At two metres social distancing, um, that meant four empty seats between people. If it was 1.5 metres, it's three empty seats. One metre, it's two empty seats. So, I mean, that we were looking at capacities of, at the very best, about 30%. And, you know, that is kind of economically and financially unsustainable. But also, what does that do experientially? Who actually wants to sit in a theatre where it's only 30% occupied? And not just from the audience perspective, because, you know, it's all about this kind of shared experience, but also what on earth does the poor performer on stage feel like as, as well? Um, so I, I think, you know, it, there's real, real issues around social distancing. Um, and I, I think, yeah, and just thinking our way around points of contact and the transactional areas as well, what can we do to make those feel safer in the, in the short term? Um, so, so yeah, I think some clear, some, some guidance from government would be helpful, steered by the science, of course, but then everybody needs to take that away and kind of digest that themselves. Thank you very, very much. I don't know if Alex, maybe you've got something to add as well. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Nicola. Yeah, I just wanted to add to this that I think some of the other um, critical issues to be overcome, particularly in the short to medium term, uh, and in no particular order, obviously social distancing, but also interestingly, a lot of venues are now um, dealing with the very real prospect of having to diminish, reduce, or totally um, give up on their workforces. Um, where does that workforce go? Can we ever get the workforce and the skill levels back again? And by this, I'm not only talking about Scottish opera, but I'm talking about performing arts across the UK in general, which, you know, as we all know, is one of the world leading kind of um, makers of, um, 
of work and requires an awful lot of specialist people to help that to happen. I also think it's worth <clears throat> remembering that a lot of the behind the scenes challenges will lie in availability of working capital. Uh, a curious old thing, but our business model relies on you can't put a show on until you've got the dough there. This is more particularly for commercial producers. Mm -hmm. So until we can start um, having access to working capital, the shows won't turn up, which means that the theatres themselves will lie fallow for much longer than their business model um, uh, requires. So I think there's quite a lot of sort of triangulation to go on there. And um, lastly, I would say that uh, like Nicola, I think there's a whole journey to go through the combination of sanitizing forward slash trust forward slash how do we reoccupy buildings well so that the audience experience is as good as it um, as it was at one time thanks Andrew I suppose uh, I hope you, you might have a, uh, an opinion on this as well and give us some insight on what issues do you think we need we need to face and deal with just now Yes, I, I, uh, there, there are two strands to my thinking on this. We, I mean, certainly when we, we, we talk about it within Bureau Hapod and talk to our clients, we're thinking about the, the journey from uh, uh, to, all the way from, uh, from home to seat and thinking about all of the, all, all of the points along that, along that route, that, how, how are people arriving at, um, at venues? Um, and that, that will vary. And, and therefore, what confidence will people have in using public transport um, uh, uh, and arriving? And will, will modes of transport change for people getting to, to, to venues? How do they arrive? There's a, the, in, in the short term, there's a whole no, new set of social behaviours that we're all learning. Um, and, and how can actually theatres and, and, and places, places of gathering, um, are, are, can, because they're staffed and because the, 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 they're, they're welcoming, there's, there's an education process there that, that is able to, to, to take place and we, we can start teaching people how this uh, new, new way of, of behaving. There may well be some physical um, changes that have, have to happen on case by case, by case is, um, different venues dependent on how access and to, to toilets, um, bar space and, uh, and cafe spaces work if people are confident enough to buy um, food and drink at, um, at, at venues, which is absolutely critical to the business and operating model of, uh, uh, of venues. Um, and then all the way into uh, into your your way into your seat and uh, and how you uh, how you find your way to to see. Now there there may well be some technology solutions to that through um, electronic um, ticketing and uh, contactless uh, exchange of money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's got to be dealt uh, and set up in an inclusive way that uh, all generations are are, um, are comfortable and uh, and familiar with. Um, uh, and then the, there may well be, as I said, some physical um, reordering of space that might be, prove to be um, solutions to that within gap. So examples in galleries that actually collections um, um, can be brought out to help define directions of uh, uh, passageways and travel through gallery spaces where um, uh, to, to help segregate people um, by actually putting more, more, um, more, more artwork on the, uh, and sculpture on, on display and or um, more more uh, more art can be taken off walls to 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 reduce crowding around so the curation of spaces can be done through actually the content but also maybe through physical physical means as as well um uh, and uh, and then lastly uh, the, the the staffing and the staff management that that uh, welcomed that friendly explanation of how things are going to be uh, going to be run so people are comfortable and confident um being a being an engineer and some of the things which um, which uh, interest myself and, and colleagues will be around physical the systems. Um, how do we give confidence that the air coming into auditoriums is healthy and fresh? Um, there, there is industry guidance. Sipsi produ has produced good guidance on, on this for, for workplace, and for, um, and that is that that is something that may need may need interpretation by design communities and uh, and, and and experts for for, for um, galleries, museums, and theatres. Um, but there might also be an education piece in that around the um, uh, changing of expectations, um, more fresh air. 
might mean that uh, people have, end up keeping coats on in, uh, in, in auditoriums, for example, um, that uh, what you expected in uh, your perfect, uh, perfect comfort level may have to vary a bit um, as a compromise to be able to have the collective experience. So the, there's lots to think through, lots of, uh, lots of challenges. It's complicated and there's no one unique solution, but creative and, uh, 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 and thought through thorough thorough processes will assist in building, um, we believe, um, building visitor confidence. Nicola, tidying up with this, uh, some of what Andrew just said uh, about the circulations of spectators and people in theatres and museums and so on, how do you think designers can help in the short term uh, with these buildings? Yeah, well, I, I think in the, in the short term, it's about um, kind of minimising risk. Um, we've talked a little bit about transactional areas like the box office, reception points, shops. Um, there was some interesting survey work was released um, at the end of last week by the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions. Um, they have surveyed um, some of their, their members who have reopened down in England, like historic garden zoos and things. And it makes really interesting reading because um, a lot of people will um, kind of have trust in the organisation itself that the staff are all PPE'd up and they're all properly trained and that cleaning regimes have been kind of stepped up and things. But actually, most people's concerns relate to other people's behaviours. And, uh, and I think that is really interesting because whatever physical adaptations we may be able to do, we can't actually police how other, others may choose to behave. Um, I, I think, you know, they, they were flagging up um, areas where, where they termed intimate spaces like toilets and, and things like that. We, we probably will find, you know, we, we've been looking at if you lock off every other cubicle in a toilet so that you can still maintain what was two metres now might need to be reassessed again this morning. Um, you know, how can, how can you make people kind of feel comfortable in these kind of short, intensely used spaces. Um, I think the box office, um, in particular in performing arts venues, it was a point of discussion anyway before pre-COVID because in a way that was stuck between the analogue and the digital because many people still enjoy kind of going in the face-to-face -face transaction, getting a paper physical ticket, whereas equally a lot of people now just rely on their smartphones and technology. So I think, you know, the IT infrastructure and things like that is going to be really important. Um, so it's not so much about, I think, in the short term, physical adaptations but also about looking at management operational issues and maybe helping you know in terms of special grants and funding and things organizations perhaps um, boost their own IT and digital capabilities um, I, th I think because it's such an, a new disease and we're all learning it seems daft to kind of rush headlong into making significant physical changes as I think has been well demonstrated in today you know just yesterday on the news there were loads of hospitality people complaining because they you know bought all their signs that said two meters and they've kind of worked to that as a rule and it's changing um, so I think taking time to kind of assess monitor and, and kind of gauge people's reactions is actually really important in this shorter term Uh, Alex, I think we've got a good question for you here from Alan. He's asking, can the theatre companies not focus more on virtual productions in the short term while COVID issues are fully resolved? Video productions by the Royal Opera House, National Theatre, Glyndebourne have been well attended. Maybe a reduced charge could be levied to view broadcast productions in the short term whilst the challenges are resolved? Alex, I need to unmute you. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Alan. Um, a good question, and indeed a frequently asked question. I guess the um, organisations that were mentioned in your question are ones that had a kind of, um, as it so happens, uh, um, 
a, a kind of COVID preparedness in terms of having invested in their uh, digital infrastructure and their various distribution platforms for quite some time before COVID-19 arrived. So they've been in the very fortunate position of having had additional investment and resource to have captured their full productions and then distribute them either free of charge or occasionally through a paywall at this time. So that's been a really happy and amazing uh, coincidence of uh, 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 you know, accidental forward planning, I suppose would be the best way of describing it. Um, there are plenty, many other organizations that for all sorts of reasons have not had that digital capacity. But what I was going to just add in terms of looking forward was that certainly my organization, we are now putting a lot of energy into exploring, you know, on the basis of optimism and resilience, we're trying to cook up some out, uh, some kind of workarounds. First of all, we're looking at getting underway with some outdoor performances as soon as we can. And I appreciate that those of you that don't know and love Scotland as much as I do will probably imagine that's going to be challenging. Um, <laughs> Short answer is yes, we've got to kind of crack on. But one of the advantages of outdoor performances is that you can actually uh, uh, kind of um, adjust the social distancing according to whatever the current advice is. We're currently exploring using some hula hoops to uh, set those out to encourage uh, appropriate bubbles to be in the right place. We're also actively explore, exploring doing some drive-in performances and also doing quite a lot of additional smaller scale touring. Now, the reason we're looking at that is mainly because we believe that quite soon we'll be able to safely muster very small numbers of people and in which case we think it's really important that as a national performing company that we're out there making a sort of operatic nuisance of ourselves across as much of Scotland as possible. Um, in terms of designers I think there's a really interesting challenge for particularly the m and &E design community so for example in our Theatre Royal and equally in the Festival Theatre in Edinburgh uh, I'm sort of known as the heating engineer uh, despite my other grand title, because uh, we have a lot of challenges where we get the um, airflow and temperatures just right for the audience, only to find that those very conditions create complexities for our orchestra players who need temperature to be maintained at a particular 21 degrees and also airflow to be minimal. Otherwise, hands and instruments um, don't work. So we've got quite a lot of work to do on that subject going forward. The other thing I would just say is that from our point of view in terms of helping ourselves, we're also looking very much so at whether we can in fact do reductions of some of our grand operas to either minimize or cut out altogether intervals. Um, um, yeah, and also maybe re initially reduce the forces we might use to stage an opera. So, you know, designers, yes, venues, yes, makers of work, yes, audiences, yes, we've all got quite a long way together to go together. Thanks. <clears throat> Just to, to add to that, talking to a different sector of the live performance industry, the, the commercial operators, they, um, they are, a number of them are, are far less keen to do that. They, uh, they see the, um, the, the quality of the, the, their very high refined and tailored um, um, product um, as something that they want to get maximum revenue from uh, a live version of that performance and not lose the potential of that, that full ticket price by um, making the content available in a, in a um, discounted online way. So it, it does depend on business and operational models for the different types of, uh, of, of um, venue and uh, an operator. And, and, I, and I think, you know, as, as a, a kind of consumer, if you like, of culture, um, you know, I'm really craving and missing that live performance experience, you know, unlike watching something that has been videoed and streamed online, that, that is captured a moment in time. But actually, you know, part of the joy of going to the theatre and maybe going to see a production that you've really enjoyed two or three times is every time you go, it will be subtly different because it yeah. depends on that interaction between the performer and, and the audience. And I think that is something that you cannot recapture online. So whilst I started avidly watching loads of plays and things that I'd missed, that I'd never had a chance to go down to London on, I kind of quickly kind of tired of it and thought, no, actually, this is just making me feel even more mournful that I can't actually go and 
physically <laughs> enjoy these yeah. things. I went, I went through a very similar experience, Nicola. I, I watched oh. the National Theatre's um, One Man, Two Governors, and it, uh, oh. it, I, I was fortunate enough to, to watch that oh. live, and it brought back memories of, of seeing it, so that was, that was fantastic. But the, the, the then seeing other productions, um, it, uh, it was, uh, didn't, didn't have the same, uh, same immediacy. No. Andrew, going back to you, that you, you went through uh, and mentioned the revenues for theatres and spaces, the importance of cafes and uh, the, uh, the other side of business to the performances. We got a question from Christopher here, is asking, will it, be, will it be the case that venue operators will begin to concentrate on what they do best, experiential art performance and stuff like that and not offer add-on such shops cafes and bars i um i, I don't know the detail of uh, of every uh, operating model but i i do know um that significant income is uh, generated through cafes bars and shops and it's a it's a vital part of the operational model for for most um performance venues and also most museums um, and galleries it's 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 vital to them now yes their primus their, their prime operation is the is the art is the collection is displaying the collection um, but uh, they do the, the the need to generate um, generate revenue is 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 super important to them and uh, and so it's it's something which cannot be over cannot be overlooked um, particularly when any subsidy um, will that, that may or may not be coming forward um, is is going to be limited. It, it won't uh, it won't cover everything. So generating as, and, and being creative in in business models that can generate and, and operations that can generate um, uh, additional income will be will be really important. I'm sure Alex has got more, more detail on that across his uh, his venues. Yeah. Uh, thank, thanks. Just to add, I completely agree with what you're saying, but. The only subtlety perhaps I'd throw in there is that it's um, uh, all of those additional, they're not alternative, they're additional sources of income and they're absolutely vital, completely, mm -hmm. utterly vital to the business model of pretty much every, uh, certainly in my world, theatre theater and theatre organisation. I mean, second only, if not, in fact, not, possibly even not as important as the role of the pantomime which as we all know is the absolute cash generator for pretty much every theatre that hosts them or every theatre group that hosts them. Can't underestimate the contribution that um, the contribution that all of that ancillary activity makes to the bottom line. Um, I also, Andrew, just wanted to pick up on an earlier remark you'd made which uh, I thought was exceptionally good which is your phrase sort of, uh, I, it was so good I even wrote it down, I think it was from home to seat and um, I think that's incredibly, uh, uh, it's an incredibly good reflection on the challenges that we all face. It's not only about what we do once you get to the door of the theatre, but it's the journey to that door of the theatre. And one of the interesting challenges perhaps that we see more of in the arena sector, is the implications of the um, Manchester bombing and the need to search everybody and how do you work your way through the practicalities of social distancing and searching and, you know, one of the potential answers is you have people arriving at pre-arranged times in order to be searched properly but so then how do you make your facilities which were already particularly front of house facilities incredibly tight when the show is full how do you make them work in such a way that people remain distance can still do teas coffees drinks etc and be searched so i think there's quite a lot to work through i suppose you know being slightly facetious i kind of see an opportunity for marquee providers <laughs> if nothing else you know in terms of how do you keep, particularly over the longer six months of the winter, how do you kind of maintain audience comfort without abandoning them on the street? There's a bit, I think there's a bit to work through there. Thanks. Could, could I just pick up on the, the point about kind of cafes and shops and all of that? Because um, obviously there's a commercial argument for having them, but also I think for, for many of the venues that we've worked on as well, it's a kind of a community aspect and somehow opening up the, the kind of art to, to more people. I mean, we often talk about 
um, and, and indeed have done on, on projects such as McManus and Galleries in Dundee and the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. We've bought the cafe and the retail offer right to the front door as a way of enticing people in. Um, because for many people, unfortunately, they still see engagement with kind of culture as a slightly elitist. And any way that we can do to attract people in, and I, I know, Alec, when we were um, working on the new foyers for the Theatre Royal. We talked a lot about the idea of the foyers being open and offering this third space and, and many cultural organisations have done that very, very successfully by having their cafes and things open all day and welcoming them to, to all sorts of communities and, and groups to come in and utilise. And I, and I think that will become increasingly important actually, I think, going forward that that they're not just seen as cultural hubs, but as community hubs. Um, and, and I think that whilst we're talking a lot about literally the buildings themselves have been shut for three months, actually, you know, it's not as if these organisations have gone away, they have put work online. You know, a lot of um, theatres have kept their engagement and participation programmes going um, throughout the last three months and things. So I, I think there are bigger issues around kind of community and audience development that make having cafes and shops really useful to have. Nicola, I think this kind of ties in with Amanda's mm -hmm. question that she asking, she's asking uh, if, you, if the panellists think that our post-pandemic world will lead to differently designed public buildings? And if so, what aspects of the design will be affected? What's, what are your thoughts, Nicola, on, on this one? Um, well, I, I think, I, you know, I've been speculating a, a bit. I mean, most of my exper personal experience is geared towards a performing arts um, venue, but I've been thinking quite a bit about exhibitions and um, in particular, because I have a slight bugbear with lots of meaningless interaction that goes on, you know, kind of, bits that flap up on boards and things and touch screens everywhere. And I'm wondering, you know, what might be the implications for that, for instance, exhibition design. Um, at the minute, you know, a, a lot does rely on touch and I'm not quite sure what we do in the short term, whether you just simply disable them and go back to, to old, more old fashioned ways of providing information. But in the longer term, you know, might, might we be a bit more inventive about the use of technology and um, maybe that might require more space. I mean, if you've got overhead projections that you then tap things with your feet and, and things, you know, that takes up considerably more space than the touch screen in, in front of you. Um, I, th I think in terms of the physical changes, I, I think we'll be thinking a, a lot more deeply about the material choices that we make, um, how durable they are, how susceptible they'll be to a very rigorous um, cleaning regime. And certainly some of my colleagues are doing a bit of research into antimicrobials and which materials are inherently more hygienic, or will there be more a move towards more natural materials um, in terms of ironmongery, say, and, and things. Um, and I think automation might come in a little bit more you know very often our starting point for our kind of civic buildings and things is that we do have things like sensor flow taps we have doors on hold open devices um, and slowly during a value engineering process these get cut and cut away and i think going forward what four months ago we saw as desirable might now become more essential because you know anything that kind of minimizes people's touch points and things going forward um, might help with this kind of confidence issue um, and building trust and and I think yeah there might be a, a kind of shift in in what we see as important and to actually simply omit some of these items because we can do it more cheaply um, will be false economy. Um, so I, I think there are issues around kind of yeah automation materials, um, the space that we we may need if social distancing is going to become a thing. And certainly the work that we've done um, in with theatres is generally being focused on on the public facing aspects, and and the foyers are lighter and area. I think there's a real challenge with um, kind of more spatially constrained historic 
buildings. Yeah. Mm. Um, it, I might just, if you don't mind, I might just add to that that I think, <clears throat> uh, looking ahead, I think certainly in terms of public buildings, as Nicholas says, foyers, etc., public spaces will need to have much better circulation. But I think we also need to do a lot of clever thinking about how we unpick the connectivity between the newer spaces and perhaps the connection to the older spaces, you know, which are traditionally through very narrow doors that are controlled by staff, um, particularly into the sort of Victorian building stock that most of our, th many of our theatres um, uh, come from. Also, I think there's quite a lot of thinking to do around how people flow. So it's not only the space themselves, but how we manage and control and, you know, keep people safe flowing through. And then I think the other big consideration is actually uh, back of house where, for example, in, in my art form, where we could easily have 150 people back of house, including chorus, orchestra, performer, uh, soloists and crew. And how do you manage them through a very narrow pass door, you know, into the building and the other very narrow pass doors onto the stage, all of which have been kind of are a function of uh, fire safety measures that were introduced in another era. So how do we get, you know, buildings to be safe for our workforce as much as um, for our audiences? Thanks. A few thoughts from me, just um, maybe dialing out and thinking about an even even broader context. And I, I, in my introductory uh, discussion piece, I was, I was talking about climate emergency and, and, and sustainability. I, I think that um, that the, the likelihood of major new cultural venues in the in the short term is is very limited. Um, I think we've got an amazing stock of, and, and, and a, a, of amazing assets in, in museums and galleries, and I think it will be uh, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at more more around adaption, looking at spaces that are able to adapt. We're, we're learning to have to be able to move on our feet very rapidly as we emerge through through this. But in the future, um, buildings which can adapt um, can uh, draw together multiple uses to engage better with people so that they may come into a into a building to change uh, change a library book but actually have the um, fantastic uh, chance opportunity to hear a, an orchestra rehearsing or something at the same time so think thinking about ways to um, in, bring, bring together multiple uses in public buildings so that we don't have to build more because uh, um, and, and use the um, our, our limited carbon budget in, in doing that. I'd also then just start to think about um, what other big challenges do we have in this in this country as far as our built environment and uh, the the, um, the the high street is a is a big challenge. The the massive change to the the way that uh, the online services of, is affecting our, our high street and the opportunity that that brings to reimagine the high street. And I believe that I firmly believe that culture has a has an opportunity to 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 make to mark its uh, its place in the in the high street to in, to better even even better engage with uh, with communities. And that's something which can be done through design through adaption of uh, of, of existing existing buildings in a in a low carbon way and I, I'd also say that that, that that resilience and that improving the environmental performance and safety of, uh, of our existing um, building stock um, is a is is a way in which we're going to have to address design challenges in the in the future. Nicola, I would like to go back to Brian's questions that he asked uh, earlier on. He's, he's asking, uh, they recently worked on a feasibility master plan for the Wimble Wimbledon Theatre. Uh, they will need to revisit the study in order to accommodate the current restrictions, do you think? And what about advise the client accordingly? Uh, well, that, yes, I, I think all kind of stu studies and, and things will need to be re-looked at in light of, of what we're, we're living through at the moment. Um, I've, I think, you know, I worked on that study too, know, know the particular pro problems with it. And, and it is a typical kind of Edwardian theatre, which has very, very restricted space. Um, and therefore there are lots and lots of, of issues about, about it. It's the literal spatial con constraints. Um, I think 
you know, what I said earlier about not rushing into things, I mean, th this is a point in time. Um, I like to think that, okay, we, we, it gets banded about a lot, the new normal, but we will get closer to what we, we enjoyed just six months ago. Um, and I, I think, yes, we, we will need, need to, to look at all our, our buildings, both those that have been redeveloped and those that are in, in the pipeline with this in mind. But I, I think making kind of quick decisions at this point in time is perhaps a, a little premature. I think there are kind of obvious things that we can, can look at in terms of material choices. Um, things like that, but we cannot physically magic more space. So what do we do with these heritage assets? Because, you know, they, they are the vital parts of our kind of towns and, and cities. And if, the, if they're no longer usable, that would be tragic. Um, and I, I think the, the use of technology um, is, is one aspect that I think that we, we should look at. And I know I think there are all sorts of questions around um, particularly kind of environmental comfort and, and things. Um, I know when we worked up at Inverness and Eden Court and did the studio theatre there, that natural ventilation, I mean, the feedback that we get from that is even when they're using that space for a day's conference and things, you know, people kind of, they understand that they're in a space where air is moving through, through passive ventilation, it feels fresh, they don't get sleepy after lunch like the way they would if they're in a fully conditioned space. Um, so so maybe we need to, to kind of think hard, harder, I think, on the services side, because I think it will be very difficult to kind of alter some of the fundamental physical constraints that we have. Um, or do we just simply say we can't use these buildings anymore? I sincerely hope not. <laughs> I think Nicola picking up on that is mm. this is um this is lot lots of response to climate emergency mm. response to this is about in some mm. in, well in quite a lot of instances about behavior change and, and expectation change um we would never have thought that we would that, that this um, a, a, a massive impact could change our behaviors um six months ago this this would never have so the we, we've seen that significant changes in the way that people behave has been possible. So smaller changes around accepting variations in temperature and uh, uh, in, in spaces, accepting uh, compromise in the way that we, uh, uh, ex what we expect out of our buildings. I have, I have more optimism that we now have been through this massive shock that we can accept more gradual changes that six months ago we may have thought were not possible. Mm -hmm. And I think it's now for, uh, as designers to help people imagine that and understand that and draw back to the shock that's happened and help people realize that incremental change in the way that we go about doing things and precedent is not necessarily the, the way for, for things to, to happen in the, in the future because that's what we're going to going to need to be able to address climate, um, the challenges that climate emergency brings us, that, that social equality um, demands um, us to, to address. It's, uh, um, I, I have optimism for that. And what, you're, what we're talking about here is, is, is behavior change in some supported by great design. Alex, uh, I've got one question here from Christopher. Is asking, will cultural event venues start to interlink even more with other operators, the theater, hotel, the art gallery, shopping center, the football stadium, opera? Is just thinking about the stadia being used as concert venues now? What are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, all of those ideas will form part of our um, steady as it were and or Nicola's you know Nicola's quite right that we do need to take time to assess what the new normal could be and could mean for us but I completely agree that uh, and indeed I don't know that I can see the new normal yet but I know that we're doing an awful lot of thinking about how we in our case how we can keep the our relationship with a 400 year old art form and all of the things that go with that alive and well and represent it in a 21st century post-COVID context. And for us, the challenge in that is uh, we believe we can modify, change, cope with some people's behaviors. We can, you know, we can make some people come with us and others will have expectations about 
no, no, the place for our particular art form is in our particular space. But equally, we, equally, we have seen in some of our pre-COVID experiments that where you, um, where you, uh, well, where we have been imaginative about how we've presented work, that actually on the whole people have come with us. So I think everyone's quite right that it's about not just focusing on a return to the old normal. It's about really, really cleverly thinking about how the new normal could work for our benefit, but also have all of those kind of equity considerations really properly accounted for and embedded and emboldened within our, within our organizations. I like these questions from Tony here. I don't know which one of you would like to answer that. He's asking, does the panel think that the extraordinary and palpable effect of COVID-19 will create a lasting impetus on how cultural organizations embrace even ever more innovative ways to create new consumer experiences and ways to engage audiences? We saw in the last few days that practicing Christian worshippers in UK Cornwall organized a drive-in church service while church remains closed for wider worships. Uh, I think this is a bit what Alex has been talking about, but I'm not sure, maybe Andrew got a thought on this as well? I, I think it will. I think also we have to think of culture in the context of all of the other um, strands of, uh, of our lives. Um, I, I think that there's going to be a lasting impact on the way that we work. Um, we're all, uh, we're all uh, communing here remotely. But that's because the the um, well, we offices aren't open. Um, people uh, have adapted and are realising that we can um, we can be uh, productive um, in many instances, not all uh, granted it working remotely. So, I, I um, air travel has uh, has shut down, virtually shut down. Um, so, international travel. So, those are those are driving fact. Those are factors which I think. Um, uh, influence the way that we and, and, and enhance the need for um, uh, for that collective experience the fact that we aren't having that social interaction in the same quantity in the same way when the way we work so I think that puts um, gives more opportunity for creative responses and uh, and, and uh, development of uh, um, of uh, cultural experience I'd also say that the impact of uh, the reduction in air travel and that will that will take time to, 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 to rebuild. Um, and actually, if we are care about our response to climate emergency, we should be that that the, that, that cannot be allowed to, to rebuild in the in the same way. So so again, our uh, audiences as a result of that have, um, will become more local, regional, um, and less international. So certainly, there's a lot of discussion within the museums and galleries uh, around. Um, the way that the way that um, exhibitions are produced for neighbourhood, for community, for 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 a regional basis, and then to make the business model work, the refresh um, rate has to, of, of those uh, exhibitions has to increase. So I, I think it's not just that if we just looked at the the sector without understanding what's happening uh, around other areas and uh, and, and other industries. We would we would also miss out on the opportunity to uh, um, to excel to create new um, approaches in the in the future. Thank you, Andrew and Nicolai. Were you adding something? Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose what I, I wanted to just say is actually I think it's, I'm kind of really interested to see what the artistic response to this period is going to be. I think there's going to be some absolutely amazing work, you know, mu music, drama, writing, um, theatre come out of this time, vi visual arts as well. I, I've, and I'm kind of interested to see what format that might take, because I think it might veer to be more experimental and less conventional and what kind of spaces that we choose to kind of show that work in as well. Um, I, I think, no, I'm, I'm very, very interested in the kind of the blending of the idea of cultural hubs with community hubs and, and make, taking kind of art and cultural experiences out of the buildings as much as possible to attract, kind of build new audiences to bring them back to our cultural spaces. And I think, you know, now is a great opportunity to do that. And I think it's already started while we've been locked down in our homes and all absorbing culture online. 
um, I just hope it translates into kind of a more physical engagement as and when we can. Alex, we've got one question specifically for you from Karen. She's asking, have you had any approaches from education institutions to use your closed facilities? How can we help them step, up, step out of their risk management focus and use our cultural estate to take the pressure off education spaces? <coughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm wearing a couple of hats when I'm answering that question across a couple of venues. Uh, and <clears throat> yes, we've certainly, actually interestingly, we've approached elements of the education sector to say, look, our spaces are available. And interestingly, the pushback we've had is that uh, there was a, a level of discomfort around how our venues could also be appropriately sanitised and cleaned for others to come into them. Yet not so much on a one-off basis, but on a repetitive basis. Equally, uh, a goodly number of venues do have uh, typically contemporary foyers attached and, and other public places. They could be more readily available to assist the education sector. But then you've got issues around distancing from schools and getting kids backwards and forwards. So at, at the moment, I think the idea is alive and interesting, but I don't think anyone has yet found a way through it. Then, Nicola, since you are the stylish lady of the panel, there is a bit of a <laughs> conversation going on here in the chat between Vicky and Alan. Vicky is asking, is it possible that building design and fashion design will need to work together? Uh, for example, attending the venues will require different types of clothes. And then Alan kind of answered that, saying, maybe it's not about radical changes to the building, but perhaps changes to what we wear to visit, visit these entertainment establishments. A bit like putting on sports gear to participate in your preferred sporting activity. It could be that theatre goers have COVID-proof outfits that we need to wear, which would be a real design challenge in keeping it practical but stylish. <laughs> Gosh, I never expected that question. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think, you know, I've seen a lot of images doing the rounds of some fantastic kind of inventions, wear, wearable sculptures almost, where you kind of put on these body suits and big bubbles over your heads and things. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that really is a practical way going forward. Um, yeah, I... I I, I think that, you know, I'm sure that, um, you know, there might well be some kind of uh, yeah, materials come out of this that are, you know, easier to keep clean and perhaps, you know, I, well, antimicrobial materials, I don't know, that suddenly we could all get dressed up in. But um, I, I think that, yeah, I think it's going to be more around some physical adaptation and a lot of behavioural change that will get us back into these buildings. Um, I can't quite see myself putting my head in a bubble. <laughs> right, I think we, let me see, uh, Alex has been busy in the background here answering questions already, so I'll go on some of my list. Uh, Christopher is asking, um, Will theatre become more like Glastonbury and more temporary and adaptable? It seems like it seems that space is the final frontier in allowing social closeness and distancing and distancing to occur. I don't know if Andrew might have some thoughts on this. I mean, yes, I, I think. Um, well, I, reflecting back pre pre COVID, I I uh, had a. Uh, a mantra of uh, intense, again, responding to climate emergency, intensifying the use of buildings, make, making, making our, our uh, built assets work as hard as possible. Now, now clearly, um, that's, uh, that's turned on its head in this, in this scenario. But I still, I, 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 I wouldn't want to see a rush to building more space for a temporary solution. Yes, we don't know how long this is going to, is going to last. I think we need to have a adapt, find different ways, um, and think longer term. And longer term cannot be one of building more. It needs to be making use uh, more more intensely of uh, of what we have. And that might be different places that uh, for performance, for galleries, pop up galleries, pop up events, and and, and such pop up performance. Um, it may be uh, making our existing buildings use uh, more intensely. So I. I have hope in our um, 
uh, that, that this uh, social distancing will not be uh, something uh, that we have to observe forever. That there will be a time uh, um, that when we when we don't, but the, we will not be returning to a, a to life that was exactly the same. Hopefully, we'll be adapting for the better, um, and we will get better inclusion and better intensification of the of the use of um, our existing built assets. Thank you. I'm aware of time, so maybe we can start wrapping up uh, and trying to close this session on a positive note. So maybe I start with Alex. Uh, what positive changes may come out of this situation? What do you think? Um, so I think positive changes will come. One is that I think people will realise in missing all of the live performances, I think they'll realise, hopefully come to realise how precious all of that has been and will engage with doing as much as possible to uh, not only participate as an audience member, but also to support those organizations that have proved to be you know, so incredibly valuable at this time, both the organizations, the artists, the makers of the work. So that's my big, uh, that's my big uh, hope, positive hope. Yeah, that's all for that. Andrew? I, I think absolutely uh, seconding Alex to say yes, um, people recognizing what they've missed. But I, I would say that there's a there is a trust um, space that uh, that I think um, cultural institutions have uh, have ample opportunity to step into and provide community um, uh, and regional leadership. Um, addressing massive challenges around social justice and uh, climate um, emergency response. And I think that uh, uh, with, uh, with audiences um, and creative thinking that they can help make a, a significant change and, uh, and help provide leadership in that space. Thank you, Andrew. And Nicola? Yeah, um, well, I, I would concur with the, those comments about audience development. I think, you know, we've, we've all, whilst we've been locked up in our houses, seem to have engaged with creativity and culture and the, and the arts in some, some way. And that I would very much hope that as we're allowed a little bit more freedom and, and these doors of these buildings reopen, that people will come and support them. I think that has been um, a greater value now placed on culture. Um, it's the best way to kind of explore the issues around identity and people. It's, you know, it's the way that we tell and share stories, which is so important. And I think the kind of what we've been missing when we've all been in our, our homes. And I think our cultural spaces um, make a really positive contribution in terms of placemaking as well. So, you know, I, I hope that people will appreciate all of that and value that more going forward. Right, this is the end of today. This virtual panel. I would like to thank you very, very much, Alex and Andrew, for your time and Nicola for all the hard work you put behind this to help you organize this. It was very, very interesting and inspiring, I must say. Uh, I would also like to order thanks our sponsors. Presenting sponsor is Domus and supporting sponsors are Stratis and Shadow. They all been working with Nicola and the team at Page Park for a number of years and involved in some beautiful projects. We are now working on the, uh, a series of these panels that hopefully we'll be releasing the next couple of weeks. And it's gonna be, we're gonna have one of these events once a month uh, up till Christmas. So we're gonna be busy. We're trying to launch the whole series together and that is gonna be together with Domus Times. So thank you again to everybody that attended today. I hope it was informative and uh, useful. Please let us know any feedback, ideas, uh, and topics you would like to be covered for the future. Have a lovely day and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>